and a nonviolent first time offender in the federal system like myself on a five year sentence would be out in 10 months on day parole and 20 months on full parole. So it's a very better thing that you bring me back here as soon as possible. Now, how does this all happen? Because there's no victim here. There's nobody claiming I hurt them. There's nobody claiming anything bad happened to them as a consequence of my action. I can show, hopefully by the end of the night, you'll be convinced that I brought more to this country, more to this province, perhaps more to this world, than almost anybody else alive. It's incredible. Like one of the things I'm really proud of that I want to tell a Vancouver audience here that I haven't bothered to even bring up across the country. You know, I've been in every province so far, except New Brunswick speaking. And we've had people come from as far as St. John's, Newfoundland, to Nelson, BC, Thunder Bay, two, three, four hundred people, sorry, two or three hundred people at a time. Listen to me. But I've got some special things I want to tell this Vancouver audience. First of all, in the 20 years since I've been doing this revolutionary behavior, I came up with this idea called overgrowing the government in 1990. And it was a brilliant, brilliant idea, if I say so myself. It's the best one I've ever had that we could somehow, because I thought, gee, even in 1990, I thought, man, millions of people have gone to jail for marijuana, and in fact, since the last 45 years, 29 people have been convicted of marijuana offenses, and 6 million people have gone to jail around the world, and 14 million of those people were charged in the United States, and over 2 million Americans have spent significant times in jail for marijuana. Canadians have, we've had 2 million Canadians criminalized in the last 45 years with convictions for marijuana, and we have 1,500 people in our Canadian jails at any one time for marijuana-related Activity. So we have 70,000 people at any one time in the United States in jail for marijuana-related activity, and a quarter million people around the world in jail right now as we speak in the modern era, 2009, are in jail. A quarter million, 250,000 people are in jail around the planet right now for marijuana. And there's 170 million people who smoke marijuana, so we're hunted down in every single place on Earth, 170 million of us. And how did this all happen? Because, one of the, you know, I only sold seeds to consenting adults over some invisible line that you don't even see from space. It doesn't exist. It's just one big planet with plants all over the place and prohibitions everywhere. And I decided to break this prohibition. I had a real scheme going. Because what we needed in the 1990s was a movement. We didn't have any movement. There was nothing. In 1990, I read a book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes by a guy named Jack Herrera. And then somebody told me, guess what, Mark? It's actually banned in this country. I said, what? Yeah, just don't you know it? I was a bookseller. I mean, I should have known. I don't know why I didn't know. But in 1989, it, 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 books and magazines in Canada have been about marijuana have been banned for two years. High Times, taken off the newsstand. The RCMP went into the uh, publishing headquarters of Rainforest Books or sorry, Blackberry Books in the 1980s, and actually seized all 5,000 copies of Grow Your Own Stone, police seizing books, magazines stopped at borders, things you wouldn't even think possible in a democracy were going on, and I couldn't believe it. And it took me five years. I eventually, one of the first things I did, before I even developed this overgrow the government strategy, was I started breaking this literature law and trying to get charged by police departments uh, throughout Canada, and so I could overturn this law in court. And eventually, we we're giving out some brochures to students in North York uh, in secondary schools in Toronto, and we finally got charged with giving out illegal drug literature. And in fact, it was a pamphlet. It was called Ten, F Ten Facts Every Parent, Teacher, and Student Should Know About Marijuana. And we were giving those out to students because what had happened at that high school and happened so frequently at so many high schools throughout this country is the police had recruited a hot young woman into the police services and decided to send her into a high school where, looking very mature, considering she was supposed to be 16 or 17 years old in this high school, looking very mature, go around, went around and asked all the senior boys in the school if they could find marijuana for her. And of course, you ask any normal teenage boy, you know, if you're a hot girl, which is what they do, send you to school, they all, they all found weed for her. There was over 50, 50 boys charged with finding weed for this one girl. And if you want to ruin lives quick, that's the fast way, because it was the same in 1990 when I gave out that brochure, sorry, 1995, as it is today. If you're a young person with a conviction for trying to find someone weed, or marijuana, you can no longer travel to the United States. You can't go to a university in the United States. You can't be a trucker anymore. You can't get bonded anymore. You can't be a teacher now. You can't be a banker now. You can't be a security guard now. All of a sudden, the whole bunch of people in your life are all closed up to you. And this would happen at this high school in 1995, like it happened in Newfoundland in 2003 when I was there. And 50 young people's lives are automatically rendered much more difficult by the act of one police officer simply going around and asking young men, vulnerable young men, if they could sell her some pot. 
And that's how we ruin lives. We manufacture so much crime that shouldn't exist in this country, and it drove me crazy. But here I was, giving out this brochure to everybody in the high school so they knew what their rights were, so that this wouldn't happen again, and sure enough, the police charged us with informing them of the facts. Now, finally, I got to court, and in the Ontario Superior Court of Judge Ellen McDonald, we overturned that very bad law, and to this day, that's why we have high times on the newsstand. And that's why cannabis culture started existing. And that's why we have all these videotapes and newspaper discussions. And because it's actually legal to discuss it. One of the things I found out that was so vital to this discussion about why is pot illegal. Because you've got to ask yourself, what is the public benefit to society from prohibition? We've had prohibition for 45 years. Two million Canadians since 1965 have been rounded up. Lots of prime ministers and premiers have smoked pot, so they know it doesn't hurt them. Right? There's no evidence to show that it does hurt you. Nobody's ever died from it. Right? We've got, and, and five to seven million Canadians right now smoke marijuana. Canada has the highest per capita consumption of marijuana in the world. We have more pot smokers than any other place on earth. You know, the United Nations says 16% of all Canadians are, are smoked pot in the last year. And that's people who entered a phone survey. People called up on the phone and 16% of all Canadians actually said to a total stranger, yeah, I smoke weed. Uh, like re recently, actually, right? And so 60, so it's got to be in the 20, 25% area. Well, there's 30 million Canadians, and there's probably 20 million uh, people over 20 years old, so I would dare say that 5 to 7 million Canadians in the last year have smoked marijuana, the highest per capita you know, consumption in the world, you know, our pre per percentage of the population. That's pretty fantastic. So why is pot illegal? For example, even though 52% of all people in Canada want to legalize marijuana, or 62% of British Columbians want to legalize marijuana. Right now, according to the latest Angus Reid poll, not a single member of our parliament has ever gotten up and said, Mr. Speaker, considering the majority of Canadians want to legalize marijuana possession, shouldn't we have a vote right now in the parliament about this very vital issue? Why should we jail, for example, we're going to arrest 90,000 Canadians this year all for pot, 50,000 for possession, about 20,000 for selling it, and about 20,000 more for growing it. And you know what? We're going to take away some people's houses, the government's going to take away their houses. They're going to take away their kids. Hey, you can be a rapist and a murderer. They don't take away your house or your kids. But if you grow pot in your house, if you grow a plant, they're going to take away your kids. They're going to take away your home. You know, they, 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 they can take away your car worth five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five thousand 25000 dollars at the border if they find one joint. It's insanity. What's in that joint that's so dangerous that would require such a punitive... Thing. What's wrong with us? In other words, what's the explanation? When you ask politicians, you don't ever get one. When, when I go to a politician, I say, listen, what's the benefit? We spent billions and billions of dollars in 45 years. We arrested 2 million Canadians. Can you imagine that? We arrested the size of Montreal. Everybody that's living in Montreal right now has been arrested in the last 45 years, if you want to visualize it, for just pot. Billions of dollars spent, jails filled, families ruined and broken. And what was the benefit? What did politicians say was what you got in exchange? At least when people rail on about socialized medicine, you can say, well, at least we got medical help. You know, whatever the system might be, at least the doctors were there to help us. And that's what they say is the benefit. Everybody gets health care. Yeah, you pay lots of money in taxes, but everybody gets health care. Okay, so there's the benefit. Theoretically, for every government policy, there should be some benefit. What is the benefit for having hounded us like animals for 45 years? Who benefits? I want to know who is the person that actually benefits by such a policy. Because Canadians don't. Canadians absolutely do not benefit. All we've gotten is more gang violence, more gangs, more crime, more drugs of every kind than we've ever had before. Right? So it clearly doesn't address whatever problem they thought they were addressing. Right? And so... 20 years ago, I thought, man, our people are really, really oppressed, so I've got to come up with some idea, some way that we can earn a lot of money. Right? And one of the things I wanted to teach people, too, is how to be good capitalists. The problem with the movement up to the 1980s and early 90s was that they were all kind of like hippie people. Right? People that didn't even like money, that did, were face socialists, and, and they didn't want to be responsible with money. They said, I believe money is a capitalist road. I said, that's the wrong attitude. We've got to have money, because we need to promote our point of view. We need to get our, our story out there. And that's only possible if one things. And I started studying revolutionary movements around the world. And I found that every single movement that started with violence still continues to this day with violence. So you can't have a violent revolution. And I thought, what a perfect revolution would be is all about peace, all about unity, would require no losers, it would have only winners, it wouldn't require violence, it wouldn't require intimidation or force, it wouldn't even require taxation. 
It would simply require that we advance a plan as our representative of what we stand for. And what is it we stand for? Marijuana people stand for one love, unity, cooperation between the races, cooperation between the sexes, where the most you know, non-classist oriented group there is in the world. When you pass a joint, everybody is welcome. I've never seen someone say, no, you're gay, you can't smoke with us, or you're black, you can't smoke with us. Never, ever seen it. We're easily one of the most open, benevolent cultures ever. I'm going to tell you that the world owes the pot people. By the time you're through, you'll understand that the world owes the pot people an enormous debt of gratitude that they cannot possibly, the straight people of the world, the prohibition of the world, cannot even begun, begin to appreciate what we have given them in the last 50, 60 years. Because the world has been made a great, beautiful, wonderful place by the contributions of the pot culture. The people of the marijuana culture have given more to the world than any other group. I'm not saying the Chinese don't make a lot of stuff. But they, don't, but they don't invent anything. They don't invent anything. They're not smoking pot in China, and they don't invent anything. They don't smoke pot in Sweden, and they haven't invented anything since the ball. Right? Okay? The, the people that are conscious, that invent great cutting-edge things, are mostly North Americans that smoked a lot of pot. It's amazing. When I get through it, you'll be totally, utterly convinced. Everything that's great in the world today came from a pothead speaking English in North America. It's amazing. And it's a consciousness that's developed from our culture of being cast. And here's the thing. 20 years ago, the situation looked bleak, and I thought, I've got to come up with some way that we can generate millions and millions of dollars. Because I looked at other movements around the world. I rejected the final ones like the IRA. But I looked at the gay liberation movement, and I thought that was fascinating. Because what they sought to do was recreate a structure. They wanted media. They wanted their own newspapers. They wanted their own radio shows. They wanted their own propaganda, as it were. And they wanted their own clubs where people could hang out together. And then they wanted parades. And then they wanted acknowledgement and normalization from the rest of the community. And they wanted to be respected. And I thought, well, that's an excellent model to go for because they, they had a legitimate point of view. They're practicing a peaceful, honest lifestyle that ought to be accepted for what it is. And that's what we do. We're a peaceful, honest lifestyle. And we're undedemic animals everywhere on Earth. So I thought, well, if people sent me millions of dollars and I sent them all these seeds, they would grow, hopefully, millions of plants throughout the world. And this would lead to the defeat of all the armies and police agents and everybody around the world who has to destroy all these things. And I said, eventually they'll realize they're being run ragged, that thousands and thousands and thousands are simply eradicating year after year after year an unbelievable number of plants that they could possibly never retire. They could never defeat that kind of behavior. And then with their money that they sent me, I would give it away and subvert the democratic system to fight the drug war with peaceful, honest efforts by people operating in the democratic sphere. And that's what I've been doing for 20 years, and it turned out to be a huge, great, brilliant idea. And that people sent me millions and millions of dollars, and I gave away, from 1994 to 2005, I gave away $4 million to groups to challenge the, in the Canadian Supreme Court, our marijuana laws, I paid for the challenge in 19, 2003, that we lost, 6 to 3 in the Parliament. By the way, the six people, the six judges on the Supreme Court that voted against legalizing marijuana were all the Anglophone judges, and the three that voted to legalize marijuana were all the Francophone judges. So never ever say anything bad about Quebec. Because right. they were with us when it counted, and then those white angle bastards. So, so remember, and they're all crotchety and white males too. But then again, so was the Senate, and the Senate in 2002 said we should legalize marijuana for everybody over 15. Because the Senate interviewed 627 witnesses, and that's what they concluded from everybody who was worth listening to, is that pot should be legal for everybody over 15. Because to criminalize it would only create problems. They realize that even if young people shouldn't have pot, they're so curious and determined to get pot that if we don't make some reasonable allowance for them to get it, they will simply do things that are more unsavory to get it than if we let them have it. And that's the bottom line. So, my name's Mark Emery, and I'm going to jail very shortly for five years for selling these seeds. And I want to reflect on some accomplishments that I've done in British Columbia. First of all, when I came here in 1994, there was no movement as I understand it today, like certainly not the way we see it today. And there really wasn't much magic or aura around British Columbia pot. That term BC bud didn't quite exist in that term. And here's one thing I'd like to say. It's a boast. It's, I'm not going to boast much, but you know what? In 15 years, there's not a single individual in this province of British Columbia who's brought more money to this province than I have. Not a single one. Not Jimmy Patterson, and he's a billionaire. 
he has not brought the money to this province that I have. Because this province produces, they say, seven to fourteen billion dollars every year in marijuana. And it's been at least four to five billion dollars a year since I started in 1994 heavily marketing and heavily promoting BC product. That's what all the seeds were about. I was on every major media, I still am in all major media, promoting British Columbia marijuana, the lifestyle, the whole, the whole kind of environment that people associate with British Columbia has come virtually exclusively from my promotion in 15 years. When you think about it, it's hard to think of anybody else from British Columbia that ever shows up on TV promoting our marijuana or promoting our culture or promoting our industry. I, I don't want to say I monopolize it all, but I've been pretty well responsible for most of the promotion about BC pot in the last 15 years. So when they send me off to jail, and they are sending me off, because it was either take five years now or face 35 or 40 years next year, because the DEA is saying I'm one of the top 50 most wanted in the world and the most wanted drug target in all of Canada, bigger than Hells Angels, bigger than anybody. And when they use hyperbole like that, you know you're not getting the low end of the sentence if you're actually trying to fight them in court. They were on a new job saying I'm responsible for 1.1 million pounds of marijuana worth three billion dollars. Three billion dollars! <laughs> That money comes all to British Columbia. You know, it's funny that the, the DEA says it's worth $3 billion, right? And that I, I agree, I probably brought more money to this province than any other human being alive. But think what this province would have been without me. Because it's impossible for anyone in British Columbia to imagine what it would be like in our rural environment, our rural areas, without that money. Like, it's easy for us to throw these figures around, but let's say I was never right. I never came to BC. I never promoted BC pot as special, and it never came, got to the size it was now. Let's say it was only four or five billion dollars instead of seven billion. Over a 15 year period, that's like a 20 billion dollar shortfall in revenues that would have gone to our rural areas. And Vancouver's do doing fine because of the Olympics and because we're a major commercial center. Vancouver doesn't really need the money that comes from the pot industry, but the rest of this province does. Because the rest of this province had a bubble burst ages ago. The fishing bubble burst 15 years ago. The mining bubble burst 15 years ago. The lumber logging bubble's always been bursting up and down. We've had so many periods of unemployment in the rural parts of British Columbia that if it weren't for marijuana, a lot of those places would be ghost towns. Certainly places like Nelson, and Caslow and all the places in the Kootenai and Okanagan are totally reliant on the marijuana crops in the fall and indoor crops to survive. There's no other jobs out there. There's nothing in those places other than tourism. But the fishing's dead, the lumber is dead, the mining is dead, you know, and to a large degree tourism is off in these areas. Without marijuana, our province would be devastated. So I'm happy to say, and you can think about this, and if you can come up with anybody who's made more money for the province of British Columbia, you let me know. But that, I think, is one of my greatest achievements, is I'm responsible for billions and billions of dollars to having come to British Columbia. So when I'm gone, I want you to think about that, because it's too late to reverse. The, this promise will continue to make money long after I'm in jail for all the work that I have done. And in my political realms, not that that's just an accumulation of my promotion over 15 years that I've promoted so much that this problem is benefited by billions of dollars. But I think on one hand, I want to tell you this in a personal way, because this is what I haven't told the rest of the country, is that I think it's been very insulting for me to actually have to go through this process of fighting City Hall for my license, considering how much this city is a reflection of my character after 15 years. I mean, Vansterdam is a term that's used all over the world to describe <laughs> a rather glorious, wonderful place. Amsterdam on the Pacific, somewhere, well, you know, and, 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 and Amsterdam itself is such a very beautiful, wonderful place that if you can ever get the public to believe that we're as benevolent and as peaceful as Amsterdam while being on the Pacific, that's a tremendous thing. The whole idea of Amsterdam has been perpetuated around the world, and it means so many great things to people everywhere. It means freedom. First and foremost, Vancouver's always been associated with freedom. But the concept of Bansham is freedom and tolerance, just like it's known in Holland.